In this animation, we will review the anatomic basis of the visual pathways and reflexes. We will also review visual field defects and some pupillary abnormalities. Let's take a look at the anatomy of the eye. The cornea is the transparent tissue that serves as the initial and powerful refracting surface. The sclera is the white portion that provides support to the eye. The iris is a pigmented circular muscle, which controls the size of the pupil and allows the right amount of light to enter the eye. The pupil is an opening in the iris that allows light to enter the eye. The lens is a flexible, transparent structure that focuses light on the retina. The vitreous humor is a clear gel that occupies the space between the lens and the retina. The retina is a light-sensitive tissue, which lines the back of the eye. It absorbs light and sends a signal to the brain. The macula is the central portion of the retina that surrounds the fovea. It provides clear and distinct vision. The fovea is the central portion of the macula and the point of greatest visual acuity. The choroid is a layer within the sclera that consists of a network of blood vessels, which serves to nourish the outer layers of the retina. The optic nerve sends the signal from the eye to the brain to be interpreted into images. Let's take a closer look at the optic tract. In this lateral view, we see the structures of the visual pathway. Light enters the eye through the cornea and continues to the anterior chamber, crossing the pupil, the lens, and the vitreous humor to finally reach the retina. The retina transforms light into electrical impulses. The electrical impulses travel via the optic nerve, passing through the optic chiasm and the optic tract to reach the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. It then continues through the optic radiation to ultimately reach the primary visual cortex in the occipital lobe. We will now look at the visual pathway in greater detail. Nasal halves of the retina receive information from the temporal visual fields, and each temporal retina receives information from the nasal visual field. At the optic chiasm, the fibers from the nasal halves of each retina decussate. The optic fibers from the temporal halves of each retina pass through the chiasm without decussating. This anatomic arrangement allows each hemisphere to receive visual information from the contralateral visual field. Therefore, the left hemisphere perceives images from the right visual field while the right hemisphere perceives images from the left visual field. The axons of the ganglion cells pass caudally in the optic nerve and optic tract to end in the lateral geniculate body in the thalamus. These thalamic axons then project via the optic radiations in the parietal lobe to reach the primary visual cortex at the posterior pole of the occipital lobe. Visual Field Defects This image illustrates the normal visual fields. A lesion in the left optic nerve causes loss of vision, or anopia, of the left eye. A lesion at the lateral aspect of the optic chiasm produces ipsilateral nasal hemianopsia. In this case, a lesion on the left lateral side of the optic chiasm results in left nasal hemianopsia. Lesions to the midline at the chiasm, where fibers decussate, are often caused by a pituitary tumor or a lesion around the cella turcica. A lesion at this point will produce bitemporal heteronymous hemianopsia. This is characterized by blindness of the lateral or temporal visual fields in both eyes, also known as tunnel vision. A lesion in the optic tract causes a defect in the temporal field of the contralateral eye and a defect in the nasal field of the ipsilateral eye, resulting in contralateral homonymous hemianopsia. In this case, a lesion of the left optic tract will cause a right homonymous hemianopsia. Because Myers' loop carries optic radiation fibers representing the upper part of the contralateral field, Temporal lobe lesions can produce a visual field defect 
involving the contralateral superior quadrant. This will result in contralateral homonymous superior quadrant anopsia, or pi in the sky. The lesion on the left side will result in right homonymous superior quadrant anopsia. Lesions to the medial fibers of the visual radiation will lead to contralateral homonymous inferior quadrant anopsia. Since in this case the lesion is on the left side, it will result in right homonymous inferior quadrant anopsia. Vascular lesions of the striate cortex, due to occlusion of the posterior cerebral artery, result in contralateral homonymous hemianopsia with macular sparing. The macula is spared due to collateral blood supply. Since in this case the lesion is on the left side, it will result in right homonymous hemianopsia with macular sparing. Pupillary light reflex. When light is directed to the eye, it stimulates retinal photoreceptors. The impulse is then carried through the optic nerve, which is the afferent limb of the pupillary light reflex. It then continues through the visual pathways. Just before reaching the lateral geniculate nucleus, afferent fibers leave to enter the midbrain, where they synapse in the pretectal nucleus. After the synapse in the pretectal area, these fibers are sent to both the left and right Edinger-Westphal nuclei. These are the parasympathetic nuclei of the ocular motor nerve, which is the efferent limb of the pupillary reflex. From these nuclei, preganglionic parasympathetic fibers project within the third cranial nerve and synapse in the ciliary ganglion. Postganglionic neurons from the ciliary ganglion then reach the papillary sphincter of the iris to cause constriction of the pupil in both eyes. The normal swinging flashlight test will now be reviewed. Shining light in one eye results in constriction of the pupil in the same ipsilateral eye. This is known as the direct light reflex. However, it also causes the constriction of the pupil in the contralateral eye, which is known as the consensual light reflex. This is due to visual axons in each optic tract projecting to both Edinger-Westphal nuclei bilaterally, as explained previously. The accommodation convergence reaction occurs when an individual attempts to focus on a nearby object. This reaction consists of three components, accommodation, convergence, and pupillary constriction. In accommodation, the ciliary muscle contracts and relaxes the suspensory ligaments allowing the lens to become rounder as shown in the illustration on the right. This helps focus a nearby object on the retina. Convergence results from contraction of both medial rectus muscles, which pull the eyes medially to look towards the nose. Meanwhile, pupillary constriction results from the contraction of the constrictor muscle of the iris to provide a greater depth of field. Argyle Robertson pupil. These pupils are typically seen in neurosyphilis, particularly tabes dorsalis. It is caused by a lesion immediately proximal to the Edinger-Westphal nucleus. The dysfunction begins unilaterally, but becomes bilateral gradually. The Argyle-Robertson pupils are typically small, unequal, and irregular in shape. When light is shined into the eyes, the pupils fail to constrict. There is loss of both direct and consensual light reflexes. In contrast, the response to accommodation and convergence remains intact. Argyle Robertson pupils present with light near dissociation. This term is used when pupils don't react to light but accommodate to near vision. Marcus Gunn pupil. The Marcus Gunn pupil is an afferent pupillary defect which is seen in conditions involving the optic nerve, such as ischemic optic neuropathy, optic neuritis, and glaucoma. When light is shined on the healthy eye, both pupils will constrict because the consensual light reflex remains intact. However, when light is immediately switched to the affected eye, 
This will lead to paradoxical dilation of both pupils. Aedes pupil refers to a dilated, poorly reactive pupil, secondary to dysfunction of the ciliary ganglion. The affected pupil is slightly enlarged, resulting in unequal size of the pupils, a condition known as anisocorea. When light is shined to the affected eye, there is no rapid response in the ipsilateral pupil, whereas the contralateral healthy pupil constricts normally, responding to the consensual light reflex. When the light is shined to the healthy eye, the Aedes pupil fails to constrict because there is loss of the consensual light reflex. Hence, there is no rapid response to either direct or consensual light reflex in the affected eye. However, if light is shined into the affected eye for a whole minute, the pupil constricts tonically rather than briskly. It is this tonic phenomenon that differs from a true argyle robertson pupil reaction where pupils won't constrict even if the light is held on the eye for over a minute. The AD pupil responds better to accommodation than it does to light. The pupil constricts in response to accommodation with delayed dilation. The most characteristic feature is that once the pupil has constricted, it tends to remain tonically constricted and redilates very slowly.